Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. It's great to have you here. My name is Julian Huppert, and I'm the director here at the Intellectual Forum. Um, some of you will know Jesus College extremely well. Some of you may be new to it. Those of you who know it well may not recognize the image that we have up here on the screen, but we'll hear a bit more about that. For those who are new, you are very welcome here, whether you're here in person or online. We've had people come uh, from most countries in the world now, and we'll see if we can tick up and pick up those last few. Jesus College has an amazing history, and it's seen technology change in so many ways. From when it was set up in 1144, when a small group of itinerant nuns were given a little plot of land outside the tiny town of Cambridge. Uh, as it grew with King Malcolm IV giving us a lot more land around here, we then get to Bishop Alcock, who in 1496 came to see how things were going. He said that there were two nuns left. Uh, one of them was rather elderly and the other was of ill fame, which you can interpret however you like, and turned into an all-male college, something we've since fixed. Uh, but it is why we have the cockerel, or to be more specific, the all-cock, as the symbol of the college. So since 1496, there have been many people who've gone on to change the world. Uh, one could pick up on uh, Cr Archbishop Cranmer, on Malthus, uh, Lisa Jardine, uh, most recently perhaps Clean Bandit. Uh, hopefully you know Rockaby. Um, and we've tried to keep touch with changes and really lead thinking locally and around the world. And increasingly, we've been looking at technological questions through the Intellectual Forum because they are one of the biggest things that we come across. And so we've had people talk about why Facebook is evil or talk about what Facebook is doing to keep us all safe. We had Twitter's global head of public policy just after Elon Musk said he was going to buy it. Uh, we've had many, many other events. And I hope you'll have a look at the ones we've had and the ones still to come. And tonight, I'm really excited by tonight's talk where we're going to really be thinking about how you do generative AI. Lots of people have heard of ChatGPT. There is much more than just ChatGPT. What does this mean when we have deep fakes? What does it mean that we can make things new? What does that mean for our understanding of what truth is? There's a huge amount here, and it's great to have a real expert. Um, Henry Ida has done so many things. He's a philosopher who's really started thinking not just about metaphysics conceptually, but about metaphysics and what any of this really, really means uh, for us. So he's worked at MIT, he's worked for a human rights organisation, Witness, he's broadcast on the BBC, he's published in most places, and I believe he, he even wrote it himself rather than getting AI to do it. But Henry, it's wonderful to have you here with us tonight. Uh, we'll hear from Henry and then have time for some questions. So over to you. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, I don't know if I could call myself a philosopher. That always feels a bit pretentious. Um, but it's wonderful to be here today um, back in Cambridge. I'm I've, of Queens, um, but Jesus is wonderful. So it's lovely to be here with you all today to talk about some hopefully weird, wonderful, maybe slightly disturbing, but hopefully always interesting uh, topics around deep fakes and generative AI. Got a lot to cover in a short period of time. And so this is going to be a bit of a kind of navigation between lots of different windy roads and passages, um, but hopefully by the end you'll have a better understanding of the landscape, how this technology is being used, and some of the key questions surrounding it. So deep fakes. I assume if you're here you've heard of them, and chances are you've heard about them in similar veins to these um, media uh, headlines. Quite scary, quite sensational, um, talking about where truth is going to die, World War III is going to be started by a deep fake of Trump, um, the topic has become, since it first emerged in 2017, pretty um, worrying to many people. And then more recently, perhaps some of you have heard about the kind of the hype train leaving the station on generative AI. This is tools like ChatGPT that Julian was talking about, DALI 2, an image generation tool which generated the starting image on this presentation. Um, many different tools which are coming into um, the business world. Investors are getting very excited. Governments are getting worried but there seems to be an agreement that this technology is gonna change the world. But you might be thinking, well, deep fakes, generative AI, what, what do all these different terms mean? What's different about them? And what they really all fall under is a category called synthetic media. That is the use of AI to generate fully or alter 
images, videos, text, audio, or indeed XR extended reality experiences, think kind of VR headsets, gaming, and the metaverse. And generative AI falls within that synthetic media umbrella. Specifically, at the moment at least, generative AI refers to AI that is generating entirely new outputs. It also typically works as a discrete tool. That is, it's not part of a general suite. It's kind of something that stands alone. And beyond that initial prompt, such as the one again on the starting screen about the cockerels, the human is not particularly involved in that creative process. It is entirely automatically generated. Deepfakes, which was coined, as I said, back in late 2017, had a pretty murky origin in non-consensual pornography. It was coined explicitly to describe swapping a face into a pornographic footage of a woman um, using an open source piece of software. Now, since the term has become much more broadly used to describe very similar things to generative AI, whether that's voice cloning, tr controlling an avatar of someone's face, changing their body movements in video, but it is also often misused in the context of more crude forms of media manipulation. Some of you might be aware of a video of Nancy Pelosi that went viral a couple of years ago where someone slowed down her voice audio, which made her sound drunk. It wasn't a deep fake, was a much cruder form of media manipulation, but has been often referred to as a deep fake. Um, and so the way that I typically now try to use deepfake, although it's by no means exclusive, and many others in the communities that I work in do, is to describe deepfakes as malicious applications of these generative and synthetic media technologies. So some of you might be thinking, well, haven't we seen this before, right? What is so new about these tools? And I think this is quite a fun uh, kind of illustration of perhaps how people were incredibly worried about what Photoshop was going to do and we seem to be okay. So what is new? What is it that's kind of revolutionary about um, AI in this vein? Um, and again, you're thinking, well, Photoshop exactly came out in 1990. It is everywhere now, and it's incredibly powerful. We live in a very synthetic world. Whether that's the commercial photography that we consume on TV, in magazines, online, airbrushed into oblivion, making an unattractive burger look slightly more attractive, but not by much, or in fashion photography, you know, celebrities, all of this different commercial media we consume is almost certainly had some kind of post-production work done on it. But it's not just the big studios. It's also the smartphone that's in probably most of your pockets. If any of you have an iPhone and aware of the portrait mode, which gives you that artificial bokeh effect, that is entirely computationally rendered. That is on a neural chip on the phone. And indeed, most major consumer phones will now have some kind of computational photography baked in. So those outputs are being shaped by AI too. And then finally, of course, we have movie magic. And uh, famous example here from Gladiator, um, one of the first examples of synthetic resurrection, which I'll talk a little bit about later, where the actor Oliver Reed was uh, digitally using CGI resurrected on screen after he died during filming. And indeed, this famous scene from Titanic, also entirely digitally rendered. So CGI, special effects, that is the kind of the, the token of, 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 of the cinema space, the entertainment space. So. We live in a pretty synthetic world already. I hope we can all agree. So what is different this time? What is it about generative AI deepfakes, which is quite so striking? Um, and I think this timeline gives you a sense of the rate of the progress that we have been seeing with generative models. And indeed, I want to touch on three key points as to why this is not business as usual in the synthetic world. The first of those is realism. So. Previously, generating a lot of the face swapping outputs that we now see on TikTok or in films would have basically been impossible to generate anything with the fidelity and quality that we now see today. These tools are both incredibly powerful and dynamic. You weren't able to clone voices as you can now five years ago. You weren't able to puppeteer a person's photorealistic avatar as you can now. And so this is an example of Deep Tom Cruise. This is a very famous project um, done by my old company, Metaphysic, um, where a Tom Cruise impersonator has had Tom Cruise's face swapped onto him. And routinely, many people think it is really Tom Cruise doing some pretty goofy things. And here on the right, these are all non-existent people. They don't exist. That has been generated using a prompt. And again, the quality of the outputs, the um, diversity of the outputs, whilst maintaining the quality, is unprecedented in the history of generative technologies. So the power of these tools is immense. The second key point is efficiency. Now, as many of you probably know, 
doing a lot of work around AI training models is pretty computationally intensive. It requires powerful GPUs, high amounts of compute, and high amounts of training data. That is the images, the photos, the audio you're using to train that model. Now, one of the big things that we've seen happening recently, which is what has led to so many people now using these tools like ChatGPT, is a massive reduction in the amount of data needed. But we've also seen these efficient models make it much more accessible, and indeed that's the third point that I'll come on to in a moment. But here on the left we have Princess Leia in Rogue One, Carrie Fisher, that actress, um, uh, sadly died um, around the time of filming, and so they synthetically resurrected her as a tribute in the film. You can see that on the left, that's the version that was in the film. This was done by Disney's top VFX experts. This would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars probably to make, months of work, painstaking click-by-click -click manual processes. And the one here on the right is the result of a guy on a gaming PC, maybe in his mum's basement, <laughs> um, you know, doing this work on his own, solo, and it's generated a result which is as impressive, if not more so, to some people's eyes than the original. And on the right here, we have Vali, which is Microsoft's new voice cloning model, which from just three seconds of voice audio of anyone here could generate what they claim to be a realistic model of your voice for text-to-speech inputs. So efficiency, less data, less compute required for powerful and re realistic results is really changing the game. But the biggest game changer, as I hinted at, is accessibility. And indeed, recently, Facebook's head of AI, a man called Yang LeCun, came out and said, this fuss about chat GPT, these language models, these image models, it's all overblown. It's not that innovative. And whilst he's kind of right, these technologies have been kind of stewing away in the background, slowly getting better over the last three, four years, I think he did miss the point in terms of the innovation is not actually what the technologies can do, but now who can use them. These tools run in browsers, they run on apps on your phone, and within a few clicks, you can generate something that five years ago, the top researchers at MIT or at Cambridge would not have dreamed of having their hands on. And so the accessibility dynamic has fundamentally changed how generative AI and deep fakes are impacting the world. And so where is this synthetic revolution taking us, right? Where are these kind of powerful tools being used? How are they having an impact? Here you can see an, al an algorithm called StyleGAN, which is cycling through faces um, of non-existent people. Um, so white collar professions is a big area we've heard a lot of noise about recently with these tools like ChatGPT and some of the image generating tools like Stable Diffusion and MidJourney. The dialogue around, or the dialogue with the line around AI has often been narrow, repetitive, low skill jobs are the most at risk, right? It's gonna be the drivers, it's gonna be the factory workers that are gonna lose their jobs first. And whilst we have seen automation impacting those spaces, these twit technologies fundamentally turn this on its head. It is the creative tasks, it is the knowledge-based jobs that are coming under most threat from these technologies. Lawyers, um, copywriters, advertisers, all of these professions are starting to be impacted. Um, as you can see here, real estate agents saying they now can't imagine working without it. And maybe that speaks more to the narrow nature of the listings they write. Um, but you know, there is a significant amount of disruption happening there. And I might add, as we saw here from the law and business exam example, in the academic sector as well, a lot of organizations are trying to grapple with how to deal with this. Film and TV, as I mentioned earlier, has already been using synthetic media or CGI of some form or another for, for decades now. But what these tools do is provide, again, a whole new set of capabilities to make really high quality effects accessible to more studios and also to do things that have never been done before. So here on the left, we have Luke Skywalker in um, The Mandalorian, I believe, or um, sorry, it was a Star Wars film. I can't remember, I'm not a Star Wars fan personally. But um, that is an entirely synthetically recreated face and indeed a Ukrainian company called Respeacher recreated the voice of the young actor, Mark Hamill, for that filming or for that show or for that movie. And then on the right, we have Ryan Reynolds in uh, Free Guy, which is a slightly more comedic take. Um, but again, an example of how this was one person who was again working solo, who Disney picked up and said, hey, do you wanna make some movies with us? And a bit of a dream story for him. So film TV already having an impact. Advertising was also one of the first places that we saw generative technologies and deep fakes being picked up. And this is a good example from a campaign done by a London-based company called Synthesia. 
and Lay's or Walker's, uh, PepsiCo being the parent company. And this campaign is called Messy Messages. My brother's called Robin, um, and I decided that um, he might want to get a message from, from Messi. Hey, Robin, what's up? My friend Henry has invited us to fire up the console tonight. I hope I can make it. If I can't be there, enjoy the game. Ah, and don't forget to bring the snacks. Ciao. So maybe not quite as good as having Messi directly send you that message, but um, this was a piece of work which took Messi's voice, trained it, identified the unique character of his voice's intonation, his style, and allowed people to send personalized messages in seven different languages in Messi's voice to their friends and family. So you could put in your name, your brother's name, and the activity you wanted to do, in this case, play a game of FIFA, and it would generate this message. Advertisers love this stuff, right? It's able to personalize content, its ability to make people feel closer to the stars and the influencers they love. And indeed, we've seen synthetic media being used in the advertising space to bring back Bob Ross, the famous TV painter, to paint a bottle of Mountain Dew, which didn't go down so well. Um, and we've seen other examples of similar campaigns to this in India with Cadbury's trying to get people to shop at their local stores. So advertisers love this kind of technology. Virtual beings is one of the stranger sides of this for me. It's slightly unsettling. But we've started to see a range of different characters and essentially personas of these virtual beings on Instagram, on YouTube, called VTubers, which are growing with millions of followers. Um, one famous one who's not up here, oh no, she is up here actually, sorry, Lil Michaela. Lil Michaela has millions of followers and has done advertising campaigns for people like Calvin Klein. She's talked about her mental health to her followers. Um, and these are kind of really interesting experiments in a way of how authenticity is viewed in the age of synthetic media and deepfakes. Um, this on the left is a, is a virtual uh, band, and indeed there's also virtual K-pop bands coming out of this space too. So increasingly for younger audiences, virtual beings can feel as authentic and relatable as real people. And there's a lot of money to be made in building those virtual beings and building those followings for advertisers as well. Satire, critical art, again, a very early use of deepfakes, which emerged around the same time that uh, deepfake image abuse or non-consensual pornography was becoming a problem. Um, we've seen around the world artists and activists utilizing these technologies to critique people in positions of power, particularly around COVID, for example, and as a way to kind of inject some life into perhaps a format which some people feel was a bit tired in the form of satire. So on the right here, we have Donald Trump in um, Sassy Justice. This was a show made by the creators of South Park, which had Trump as a small town reporter in uh, the Midwest of the US with a whole range of interesting kooky characters in classic South Park style. And on the left here, we have an example of um, uh, synthetic lip synchronization done um, around the speech that was prepared in preparation for a disaster with the moon landings. And so this is Nixon reading the speech that he would have delivered if Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and the other guy whose name I can't remember and I feel bad about, um, did not make it to the moon or had perished on the moon. So a really powerful artistic project looking at how history can be distorted and shaped by synthetic outputs. Communication, and this kind of links in with the next one as well, another area that we're seeing quite rapid change. So here on the right, we have Facebook's Codec Avatars project. I work with Facebook around virtual reality and their, their work on metaverse applications. And they're doing some incredible work with building photorealistic embodied avatars for VR. So they have a test with this set of Codec Avatars, which is what they call the ego test and the mother test. The ego test is you have to love your avatar as if it were you. And the mother test is so does your mother. Um, Zuckerberg has said that he thinks that these Kodak avatars will contribute to climate change or fighting climate change because people won't need to fly anymore to feel the social presence of being in the room with someone else. Which to some people might sound quite scary, uh, partly to me too. And then here on the left we have a new announcement just last week from Samsung with their Bixby assistant on their phone which is now allowing you when you can't make a call to clone your voice so that you can type a voice message to send to the person that was calling you. We've seen other applications of this by the likes of Apple and NVIDIA, so that when you're looking at a screen, when you're on a video call, it can automatically correct your eyes, so it looks like you're looking at the lens when you're not. 
And we've seen other applications of synthetic voice being used in various contexts to help people kind of send fun and silly messages and so on. But these tools are often quite subtly introduced into these spaces. They're not necessarily given a big announcement. But with the whole hype around generative AI, we're now seeing companies really shouting about their capabilities in this space. And I guess leading on from the communication side is accessibility. And I guess this is one where, for me at least, I, I think these are quite clearly positive examples. There isn't a huge amount of ambiguity. So people who have lost the ability to speak, obviously a Cambridge icon being Stephen Hawking, back in his time would not have had the option to have a personalized voice. Indeed, that's why he got the kind of robotic American voice, which went on to become his brand. And indeed, he rejected a more personalized voice later in life. But if he were to suffer that condition now, the technology does exist via projects like Project Revoice to give people a custom synthetic voice that sounds like them. And people who have had this work done have said that it really feels like they've saved part of their identity. Their voice is something that is an integral part of who we all are, right? So this, for me, is, is, is a fantastic project that shows how the technology can be used to help people feel, feel as they are and maintain their identity in the face of adversity. And on the right here, we have an example of generating sign language automatically, synthetic sign language, direct from speech in real time. So again, making content accessible to audiences who previously would not have been able to engage in it. We've all seen on the BBC or ITV, the person signing in the bottom is only on select shows. This kind of technology could help create sign language for all content. And it's worth mentioning as well that these technologies can also be used to help with dubbing, to make um, perhaps languages that have smaller um, speak, uh, speakers um, access content easier by automating that dubbing process. So after all of that, you might be thinking, that sounds great. This is awesome. You know, what's the concern? Is this just fear of the new? Is this just, you know, techno shock? We don't understand this. This is new to us. We're kind of, you know, silly humans. We'll get used to it. A bit like Alexa when that first came out, everyone was a bit like, oh, I don't know about having a voice in my home. And then suddenly everyone's got an Alexa and kind of doesn't even think twice about it. And here, this is a great poster from the early 20th century when electricity was first being introduced as a propaganda poster, which was produced to say that electricity was going to you know, tie us all up and it was going to be awful and scary and, and bad. And here is a kind of a historical range of bad hot takes, basically. Um, my favorite is, you know, telephones turning us into transparent heaps of jelly. Um, so is this just fear of the new? Is this just techno panic and we'll get used to it and these technologies are just going to change everything for the better? Well, no, as you might have guessed. Um, and indeed, this is where a lot of my research has really focused on over the years is mapping deepfake landscapes. So back in 2019, I released the state of deepfakes uh, with the company I was working for at the time, DeepTrace, which is a deepfake detection company, which was the first kind of landscape map. I wanted to understand what the hell this technology was actually being used for, right? Like, how was this changing people's lives? What was being overblown in the media at the time? What was actually something that we should be worrying about right now, not just preparing for? And as mentioned earlier, deepfake image abuse or non-consensual deepfake pornography is still to this day the most prominent malicious use of this technology. And this is the original Reddit community where the name came from that was banned in uh, February of 2018. But since then, we've seen, unfortunately, communities online in the dark corners of the internet proliferate and grow extensively. And this has happened almost exclusively because of the increasing accessibility of the tools. Just as the tools I was talking about earlier, like ChatGPT, like Dali, are now becoming more accessible, so too are the tools that are explicitly designed to harm and abuse. And indeed, the report here that I did on image abuse where I identified a bot on Telegram for synthetically stripping images of women from just one photo had tens of thousands of users and it targeted hundreds of thousands of women, most of who were private individuals. And here on the right, we had an application which had a very similar gamified interface for face swapping into pornographic footage. And indeed, it used to be that this was celebrities who were being targeted. This was, um, you know, Scarlett Johansson, this was Emma Watson, these famous women who are victims, like any other victim, but famous individuals. But the scaling of these tools and the accessibility of these tools now means that we're seeing increasing numbers of private women, everyday women, having images taken from their social media accounts, stripped, their faces swapped into pornographic footage, causing untold harms, both when it's known and obviously when this is created without their knowledge. 
We've seen this being used in the political sphere against politicians, female politicians, as a way to kind of stifle voices. And there have been reports of this recently with a Twitch streamer who had created um, pornographic deepfakes of his Twitch streaming colleagues, um, which caused a huge amount of harm to those women. So this is a really big problem right now. It is often um, understated in comparison to threats that I'm going to talk about in a minute, but it's worth remembering that this is still the biggest problem. Disinformation is another one that we've seen a lot of people talking about, again, back to those headlines on the second slide of deepfakes causing World War III, people thinking that politicians are going to be targeted with really realistic fake videos saying that they're going to ban guns in the US or that they're going to criminalize abortion, for example. We haven't quite seen the levels of sophisticated deepfakes in politics and in the disinformation sphere that perhaps have been feared and anticipated for the last five, six years. But we're starting to see more. This example on the left was of the Ukrainian president Zelensky, where in March of last year, a fake video was hacked onto a Ukrainian TV news channel of Zelensky ordering his troops, troops to surrender. It was a crude fake. It was quite easy to debunk. And the Ukrainian government had done a great job of pre-bunking, that is warning their population that something like this was going to be coming. But it's an ominous sign of things to come and that, you know, we can't be complacent just because this one was bad, that the next one won't be of a higher quality. And this image on the right is more recent, this is from a couple of months ago, um, where someone published this photo of, um, you know, uh, the, the riots um, going on or the protests going on in, um, in Paris and France. And it looks like a perfectly normal photo until you realize that this, this police officer has six fingers because these models are really bad at generating hands because they don't see many hands in the training data. And so we're starting to see these kinds of synthetic manipulations leaking into the information sphere more and more. And again, that is happening as more and more people gain access and start to weaponize the tool sets. And this leads to a concept which arguably has done more damage than deepfakes have up until this point. And this is this idea called the liar's dividend, which as I say up here, effectively when you can make you know, fake things look real. It also provides a really great excuse to say that real things are fake. And we've seen this extensively. This is something which is happening around the world in a global context. Notably in the US, on a certain side of the uh, political spectrum, we're seeing increasing numbers of, of people claiming that things that have been well documented have not happened, that they were fake or that the content isn't real. Their supporters believing that inconvenient truths are not truths, they are deepfakes, they are synthetically altered content. We even saw one of the January 6th rioters who was caught on film trashing the Capitol claiming that, or his lawyer was claiming that that was a deepfake and that wasn't really him. And how could they prove that it wasn't? And also we have cases like this one in Myanmar, which I was involved in, in real time, where a colleague of mine in the US who works in human rights and digital media reached out to me to say that he had heard from his colleague in Myanmar that a video was going round of a minister giving a confession and that people were starting to think that this was a deep fake. Now, we looked at this video and we decided that it wasn't a deep fake based on certain analysis that we could conduct on things like uh, regularity between breathing, swallowing patterns and speaking and so on. But the video was a video of a live stream. And so the video was very um, lossy, as we'd say. It had a lot of artifacts. It was glitchy, compressed. And so a lot of people thought it was fake. They thought that this was not a real video. And so they ran it through online deepfake detection tools, which were not very reliable, which told them that it was real, or that it was fake, sorry. And then a lot of people in the country to this day still think that the government, the military junta, has published deepfakes of false confessions, when actually it was more likely a forced confession. So the liar's dividend is having a, an impact already when anything can be faked, everything could be fake. And that's something that right now is more of a problem than the actual uses of deep fakes that people have been worrying about. Corporate sabotage and espionage. Fun topic, but back in 2021, the FBI put out a warning saying that companies um, should be worried and social governments that we're going to see bad actors almost certainly using this in foreign operations to steal IP or to try and get political secrets. And again, to those of us who knew this space well, we're thinking, well, it's not that they almost certainly will, it's that they already have. Um, these two ladies do not exist. These are non-existent photos, again, generated by the same algorithm I showed you earlier with that, uh, that GIF of the cycling through of faces. 
And these accounts were after two different things. Katie was connecting with high-level government officials, people in think tanks, trying to get into the Washington circle, asking some inconvenient questions. And Maisie was interested in Tesla short sellers, that is, people who were betting against Tesla's stock, to try and understand what their positions were. Now, both these accounts were found out because these images have a very distinctive profile. You might already be able to see from the way that the faces are presented, from the backgrounds being inconsistent. There are some telltale signs around what are called style GAN images. But, as I showed you earlier on the slide of realism, these images are getting much, much better. It is getting much easier to create more realistic versions that train out these imperfections. And so, Katie was linked back to, um, at least by the FBI or by the US, to uh, Chinese operations, and we don't know who was behind Maisie. But these profiles are popping up more and more. Some of you may well have come across them on LinkedIn or Twitter or one of these social profiles or social networks. Um, and as the ability to create better photos increases, combined with technologies like ChatGPT that can pass a Turing test with ease, we're going to have a problem on our hands when it comes to how these bots are used. There's also a slightly more direct form of corporate sabotage, which again is looking at things like stock prices. So some of you might remember or may have heard that when Elon Musk, owner of Tesla, um, went on Joe Rogan's podcast, a very popular kind of edgy pop, uh, podcast, he smoked a joint. Or at least he had a toke on a joint. Didn't seem to enjoy it very much. Um, and afterwards, Tesla's share price crashed. Wasn't the best look for him. Wasn't the best look for Tesla. But we have activists and people already making really realistic-looking videos, which are fake, of people saying or doing things that they haven't done, which could impact businesses, bottom line, or their share price in a similar way. This is a still from a campaign from an artist and activist who worked with Brazilian indigenous groups where he got Jeff Bezos to say, I commit to a 25-year pledge to saving the Amazon rainforest. Now, you can imagine if this deep fake Bezos was saying something very different, like we're going to increase Prime's price by five times, or we're going to commit fully to renewable energies for the rest of our um, operations. That could affect stock prices in the short term. And all it takes is a window of time where other people haven't noticed, it hasn't been corrected on the record in the media, for someone to either sell at a high or buy in at a low, and then suddenly you have a pretty messy situation on your hands. As the saying goes, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth's got its trousers on. So that window of chaos is a key avenue for attack when it comes to political and business espionage and corporate sabotage. We also have biometrics. So again, I'm sure many of you here use Face ID or fingerprints or even voice recognition tools. When AI can generate a version of you which fools these biometrics, as well as maybe friends and family, we're in trouble. And indeed, we're starting to see this already. So this was a vice journalist who broke into a bank account using a synthetically generated voice on an open platform that any of you right now could get up on your laptop or your phone. And this is an example of liveness detection, which is a lot of applications will try and stop you using a piece of paper with someone's face printed or a model or a dummy of a head by trying to measure whether they can see if the person is moving, you know, their face, facial gestures, blinking and so on. And again, we found that Tom Cruise can be put on someone's face quite convincingly to pass these kinds of tests. And then finally, vishing. So vishing is a pretty clumsy portmanteau of, of voice and vishing. Uh, phishing attacks, of course, being impersonation of someone else in emails to try and get secretive or confidential information. And in the business world, we've seen several reported cases of millions of dollars being stolen by someone calling up, impersonating a CEO, impersonating an official, and claiming, you know, can you send this money to so-and-so, or this financial controller needs this, can you send this over? Now, these have been reported by the insurance giants. So, we're not entirely sure about the nature, the, the forensic nature of the, uh, the audio. It could just be in a good impersonation. But as we're seeing with some of the other attacks, this is coming. This is no longer something which is entirely theoretical. And I've seen cases of people fooling their mums by using synthetic voices um, to call up and have a conversation, which was an interesting one. So those are all quite scary use cases. It's a bit worrying, right? It's a bit concerning, even with some of the more exciting, interesting use cases you saw at the beginning. But there's also a swathe in the middle here, and this is what I want to end on, of the kind of moving beyond the black and white, the ethical ambiguity, the space where we're not sure if that 
uncertainty and that unease is coming from a deep-seated ethical problem or if that's coming from a real kind of just fear of the new. Anthony Bourdain, famous TV chef, sadly took his own life a few years ago. A director made a film about Anthony Bourdain and this film was a kind of a story of his life. And in this film, he cloned Bourdain's voice to read an email or a letter he had written. But he didn't tell the audience. And it seems that Bourdain's estate wasn't entirely sure about how he was going to use it. This letter was meant to insinuate he was feeling suicidal and that he was, he was um, in a bad place mentally. And this case really got under people's skin for several reasons, right? You know, there was no consent. This is synthetic resurrection. Bourdain wouldn't have liked this, right? His fans were saying that this is not the kind of thing he would want. His ex-wife, who's no longer part of his estate, was saying Anthony wouldn't have wanted this. There's also a problem of disclosure, right? The audience did not know that that audio was not real. There was no label. There was no um, kind of pre-roll warning. It was snuck in. And a lot of people felt deceived, particularly in the uh, context of documentary, right? Which a lot of people think of as very much about reporting the facts. And so in this world of fast-moving generative technologies, of deep fakes, of synthetic media, there are some really key questions that we should be thinking about, and indeed that I've been working on with several organizations around, which I want to leave you with as kind of things or food for thought. So when does consent matter, right? If I'm going to send a face swap of my mum onto Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic, do I need my mum's consent for that? Probably most people here would be like, maybe not. Novelty, kind of fun. You know your mum quite well. But then what if someone wants to clone your voice to send to a friend for a joke? Is that okay? What if someone wants to clone someone else's face in a kind of more edgy context? And you can imagine some of the things that I'm kind of thinking about there. And I've seen people doing. Where consent kicks in is really difficult. We tend to think of public figures as okay for targeting in these contexts. People in positions of power punching up against power, it's okay in the context of satire historically. But do deepfakes and generative technologies change the game? That level of hyper-realism, does that change how we should think about these kinds of content and where consent comes into the picture? Secondly, should we have a right to know whether what we're consuming is real or not? Now, that's a really loaded question, right? As we touched on earlier, synthetic media and synthetic content is everywhere. Um, if we had to have a label on everything that's synthetic, there'd be more thing, labels on things than not, by quite a margin. But how can we effectively disclose synthetic content like that Bourdain example? Is that about providing labels? Is that about doing some kind of digital watermarking so that people can tell by another app? For example, the Content Authenticity Initiative by Adobe which is working to try and provide a kind of watermark on every single piece of content to, check, to track how it's been developed and altered. So do we have a right to this? If not, how can we tell, right? And that's something that I'm sure there might be some questions on after this around deep fake detection and so on, which I'll be happy to touch on. Third is, how do we balance access? How open and how closed should these tools be? The recent arms race around generative tools from the likes of Microsoft and Google, now Amazon's getting in on the action, Meta again with Facebook. This arms race dynamic leads to often corners being cut on issues like safety. And indeed with Microsoft Bing's new chat mode, Sydney, we saw some pretty disturbing outputs coming from journalists and people testing these models. So how do we get that balance right? Are we gonna be like the CEO of Stability AI who creates Stable Diffusion, the image generation tool, who believes philosophically AI technologies that are this powerful should not be held in the hands of the few and this should be democratized? Or are we gonna go closer to the side of Google at the moment at least, saying that this is not safe and responsible to release these technologies and we may not be first, but we, we, we will be best for society in the way that we release them. And then finally, is the law fit for purpose? The kind of obvious answer is not really at the moment. Um, there are certain kinds of harms that are captured by this, right? But when it comes to things like, for example, training data, if an artist's images are being used in a model to generate artistic outputs that look like their style, and people are asking for things in that style, how can you tell what is being used to generate what, and should that be seen as a violation of copyright? 
a lot of laws around intellectual property, around portrait rights, around entertainers, actors, are going to be fundamentally disrupted and are being disrupted by these technologies. And so from a legal perspective, we need to figure out how we're going to navigate this and what laws need updating, which laws, uh, laws need scrapping, and which ones do an okay job as it is. And then, I guess, finally, building a better, better synthetic future. Who are some of the people that are all trying to work to um, make this space better, a better synthetic future for all of us, responsible use cases, ethical use cases? These three organizations are, are ones that I would really um, point to. Content Authenticity Initiative, as I min uh, mentioned a minute ago, from Adobe, doing some incredible work trying to get transparent, open systems for authenticating all digital content. Partnership on AI, just this week released a set of uh, guidelines for responsible synthetic media creation with some of the biggest companies signed up, which is good. We need to get everyone on the same page here. And then finally, Witness, as I mentioned earlier, incredible organization working on human rights and making sure that all voices are represented at the table when we're talking about these technologies, not just white Westerners. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. And here's some examples of where I, I get it quite wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. R really brilliant. We have time for questions. If you are in the room, just put your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you, whether you're upstairs or downstairs. We've got some online. I want to start off with one that we pre-recorded mm. uh, from Janet Burgess. How can I check whether you are not a fake? A fake Jesus college? <laughs> um, you can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean... The, the, this is one of the things that I didn't touch on here, which I'd have liked to in a way, which is how can we kind of get around this problem of, well, there aren't any tools that are reliable enough to detect deep fakes. And I don't have any evidence of watermarking or authentication on this image or this metadata of an image or a video. So I'm kind of screwed, right? And the fear for me is that in this world where we can't trust anything, we don't have that baseline for truth in digital media, that that means that our cognitive biases raise further to the surface. And so we start to rely on our gut more often, which then obviously is impacted by lots of other biases and things. So it's a really important question. Um, I think the best option is this content authenticity initiative. Detection isn't reliable enough. It can do more harm than good if, you know, it's, if it's used in an unreliable way. I think going from bottom up, trying to secure content from the moment it's created is going to be crucial. And indeed, some legislation being discussed by organizations like the EU may well push for organizations to do that. Fantastic. Any questions in the room? There's one at the back there. Thank you. Yes, I think just to um, build upon what you just said at the end there, this, um, there seems to be the, the rate of realism is matched only by the rate of uncertainty. Mm. And I do wonder whether that is a conundrum facing Meta as it seeks to have ever more real avatars using ever more content, potentially synthetic or otherwise. How can we actually trust the people that are virtually presented to us? Mm. And do we actually have a default where we actually have to be in the same room, actually, to go completely against what the objective of Meta? Yes, yeah, so I, sh I should start by saying I cannot speak on Meta's behalf. <laughs> I, um, but, um, you know... Um, I think one of the key areas when it comes to hyper-realism is comes back to this open-closed thing, right? It's like, how do we gradually release these technologies in a safe way? Um, how do we test them prior to launch for unintended consequences and side effects? Um, an example of this is there's an app called Replica, which is a chatbot, which was recently taken offline because it turned out a lot of young people were starting to have kind of intimate conversations and relationships with this chatbot. It was banned in Italy. And in the wake of this, there were a lot of people who were mourning the loss of the relationship they had with this chatbot. And so it doesn't even have to be hyper, hyper realistic to have these quite substantial impacts on people. I do think, to your point around kind of, well, we need to get back into a room together to know what's real and to kind of have that connection. I think we may well, have, we may well see that. We may well see um, politicians and people like this returning to more direct forms of communication with their audiences, putting more emphasis on touring the country and getting yourself out there in the, real, in, in, in the flesh. Um, but also we've seen in Korea, um, the, the president on his last election campaign created a synthetic avatar of himself to talk to voters. So it really does go both ways. But I think I share the concerns that this is moving so fast that we don't really understand the full impact on society outside of some quite obvious ones. 
Um, and we need to try and put, put the brakes on a little bit, but that's fundamentally against the market forces that are driving it. So it's a difficult one for sure. Okay, can we go to a question right at the back here? Uh, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that this legal aspect, right, that will be um, altered by, uh, by this technology. From your perspective, what would be the best way or what would be the first or priority area that the policymakers should pay attention to? Would it be intellectual property rights? Would it be mm. copyright? Or would it be um, like a package of things? But, well, knowing that it is not that easy to package things, maybe you could just say what would, to your mind, be the priorities? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a really difficult one. Um, I think, depending on who you talk to, they will argue that their... their um, part of the debate is the most important right. Um, some of the legislation we've seen coming forward most um, recently and most urgently has been the stuff around image abuse, right? Trying to explicitly outlaw um, intimate image abuse around or with deep fakes. And we've seen that fairly globally um, in different countries, which is good. And I think that is urgent because it is currently the biggest problem, right? We're not talking about future threats. We're talking about real women right now. Um, but we've also seen countries like China introduce their deep synthesis law last month. Um, that includes mandatory labeling of synthetic content that involves getting consent for data um, and perhaps controversially includes some laws around not being able to give away or sorry to publish kind of mistruths and it's unclear who decides on what those mistruths are. Um, but I think, you know, these kinds of broad ap approaches to synthetic media and deepfakes and generative AI are probably the better ones because it helps you really get the whole picture. Stapling on amendments to here and there really makes it hard to understand how all of these different things intersect and, and work together. Um, so keep an eye on the EU AI Act, which is currently going through um, uh, the EU process. Um, that's going to have some interesting uh, implications for generative AI and synthetic media, um, particularly around what they're classing high-risk AI technologies. Just before we break, I have another question of the room. Alea Martha was asking about deep fakes. Are, are they digital sexual assault? Are they criminal at the moment? So, it's, it's so so. In my, in my opinion, yes, it is digital sexual assault. Right? I don't think it's. Um, I think that's one of the problems that we're having. Actually, is that a lot of the perpetrators of of this kind of abuse, they see it as a bit of a joke. They think that it's just a bit of fun, it's clearly not real, therefore it can't do harm. And it's obviously just completely wrong. And I think that actually speaks to a broader need for education um, and to help people understand that this is a form of sexual abuse and that you are a sex offender if you perpetrate this. Um, it depends on the country. So at the moment in the online safety bill, which is currently working its way through Parliament, um, that is, they have now included a provision, which I advise a law commission in the UK on, about explicitly criminalising uh, deepfake pornography. Um, there is not a provision in, I don't think, for what they call a simple making offence. That is, if you're consuming it privately and you're not publishing it, um, which was controversial. I wasn't overly happy about that. Um, but countries around the world are putting legislation in place. Um, I think Korea has some coming forward. Again, China um, and the US has got several bills coming. So, yes, it is becoming that. And I think it will be commonplace, hopefully, in the next few years. So I think we have two questions from that side there and then right at the back. Isn't there a question of gradations of uh, fake. I mean, it seemed to me Julian's question to you and the f photographs, but Julian's question to you, are you a fake? Which was, of course, meant as a joke, but what did it mean? Are you really a human being? Are you really the expert you're pretending to be? Are you really Henry Hazardo or uh, someone else? And here, this clearly isn't a salmon swimming in a river or a freshly made banana bread. So that's very clear, but I think there are lots of situations where it depends quite on the uh, definition. Mm. I hope I'm Henry Adger, unless we had too much to drink at dinner, <laughs> Julian. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right. And I think this is, I think that there is something to that, which is, you know, again, my background's in philosophy and I studied hallucinations and illusions primarily. And looking at the kind of the base nature of experience is always interesting because things aren't ever really truly as they seem. Um, we often build narratives and stories into the way we perceive the world, and that obviously changes depending on whose narrative and whose story you're looking at it from. I do think deep fakes and synthetic media and generative AI are making people realize perhaps that the world isn't quite as real as they thought it was before this technology as well, hence why I started with the, uh, the outline of these different um, kind of existing synthetic practices. 
So I think maybe maybe one upside to this is that we do have a, a broader assessment of um, how we form epistemic judgments about the world um, off the back of this. But I think it's going to be a bit of a, an uphill battle. Um, and as I said, the technology right now is not mature enough to provide the authentication we need for these new technologies that are coming. So there's going to be some bumpy years ahead whilst that kind of matures, um, hopefully, a fast pace. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, that was a brilliant talk and personally interested for me because my research focuses on generative AI and synthetic data in healthcare. And there's loads of use cases in healthcare in terms of data privacy and augmentation of data sets. Mm. One thing that concerns me and something I've published about is the risk of getting around legislation, so getting around GDPR and people synthesizing data sets or image sets with the purpose of sharing them maliciously. So social media sites or insurance companies trying to sell people's data when they're fake data sets, so they're not real people's data, they're not governed by GDPR, they're completely exempt really from data protection legislation. And I just wonder, do you share that concern? Do you think it's mm. valid? And if so, is there any way around it if it's fake data, not real data? That's a great question. And I should add that I did actually have, um, I did have a slide on here which included some of the healthcare applications which I, I decided to cut for time. But I wish I'd kept it in now around synthetic data being used um, to help train for things like radiology and so on, um, which is really, really exciting and really cool. Um, synthetic data is a really interesting one. So on one level, you know, we have the same problems that we do with training image generation models, right? Which is some of these models, they do what's called hallucinating, which means that you can actually find in the images images from the data set. So it more or less clones an existing image and adds a little bit of noise around the face, for example. So there are questions, right, about how synthetic it really is, right? How much of the original is in the, um, the derived output? Um, but then also, as you said, I think how people will start to creatively try and play with these tools to avoid traditional forms, I say traditional, existing forms of legislation is going to be a real challenge. And I think hopefully we will see along with the IP concerns and the copyright concerns, similar concerns around the issues that you're talking about. I'm not entirely aware of any legislation or policymakers that are specifically coming at it from that angle, but um, it's a really interesting one. Thank you for putting it in, putting it on my radar. Um, there's a couple of questions over here, but can I just bring in one from online from Jen Person um, about educational assessment. So this is a field which is going away from face to face with a push towards exam remote proctoring technology. Is anybody working on whether those tools detect tech impersonation? And she points out that the commercial push is towards tools demanding biometric data from candidates, but the very stuff that's very high risk to share. Interesting, yeah. So on the virtual kind of, I mean, education is one of the key areas that I'm sure, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, let's put it this way, some of the people in here who are students may have used ChatGPT in an academic context, wouldn't put it... Wouldn't surprise me. I've got friends who work in, you know, businesses who are writing pitches and stuff with this with this technology. Um, and a lot of the different education boards around the world are now having quite a lot of concern about this, right? Some are trying to ban it. Some are trying to put in rules for how you can use it. Some professors I've seen trying to put together lists of how you can spot a chat GPT essay. Um, and it's really, really hard because it, there may be some telltale signs. For example, chat GPT is a very confident bluffer it will say a lot of things which are just wrong but it will sound pretty good particularly around things like numerical reasoning so in answer to the question i think but there may well be ways to try and authenticate through something like keystrokes or something like this that the, the output is being generated in a certain way but then that also comes with privacy concerns on the other side um so it's a really difficult one i think personally schools you know, uh, trying to ban it on their internal internet is quite naive. I think it's more about adopting and, and, and understanding how this is going to change things. Um, and then, and then to the to this, could you repeat the second question, the second half? Sorry. Oh, well, I think the second part was about um, whether it's a good idea to encourage all of these companies to collect biometrics from every pupil, given mm. the risks if you share all massive biometrics. If you have a database of mm. every A-level pupil in the country, that yes. presumably has you know some risks. I don't think it's the best idea, especially <laughs> for a company to be doing it. Um, but yes, a difficult one. So something's come back to you. Um, there's a number of questions. That come up. There was one up here first, um, and then I've seen a few others. Uh, the gender balance isn't brilliant, but you know, we'll see if we can we can fix it. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so you, m you just mentioned that you have like philosophical background, and I have kind of rev like a relevant question. Uh, can the this was GPT this was six years ago, so be <laughs> gentle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can ChatGPT or any other language model reason? And you, you just mentioned that the numerical reasoning and all. Uh, the, the first question, uh, mm. and the sec second question is like. Uh, ChatGPT right now is like reactive, like uh, it expects us to uh, give the question and then it kind of answers the question, right? Mm. Uh, what if it will be proactive? What if it start uh, asking a question? And will it push people to, I don't know, to drop PhD or to commit suicide or any other things? What do yeah. You think about it? Yeah, so I, I guess for the first question, can it reason? There's an interesting thing there about whether to reason you must be kind of an agent, some kind of autonomous agent, right? Um, and I think we can agree that animals we would deem to not be rational can incidentally act in rational ways. Um, and so I think there's a real question of intentionality around rationality, um, which I don't think at the moment ChatGPT conforms to. It's essentially a very fancy um, predictive text model, right? It has learned from the billions and billions and billions of, of, of pieces of, of text it's read what is the most likely thing to come next in a sequence. And based on the transformer technology, which is the T in GPT, it has a really good contextual understanding of the whole piece, not just say one word or one sentence. So in that respect, I don't really think you could say it reasons, it more just spits out things that it think will, will please you based on the prompt you've put in. Um, the reasoning fixes they're trying to do now are things like, if you said, I don't know, one good one I saw was like, if you you know, I, I think it was like, which way is more a pound of feathers or a pound of steel? And it was trying to give you a great answer as to why the, the steel would still weigh more, you know? So those fixes are more manual fixes into the system. So I don't think, I don't think it can reason, basically, at the moment, at least. Um, and then to your second part of the question, it's a really interesting one. Um, you know, these, they may not start the conversations, right? It's, you may not be on your desktop and ChatGPT suddenly pings up some interesting take or message, um, but it can suggest things. And indeed, Sydney, chat, uh, Microsoft's Bing chatbot, which was based off ChatGPT, did start suggesting some pretty interesting stuff like break up with your wife and be with me to a journalist who was writing about it. So we are seeing that kind of stuff already. And I think coming back to the idea of people falling in love with these chatbots, vulnerable people and people who are perhaps in vulnerable circles or particularly siloed information circles, this could be used in pretty dangerous ways. And indeed, there is some good research coming out of Georgetown in the US around how it could be used for terrorism. So worth keeping an eye on. So we've got the question here and then there's one over there. So. My question is reverting to the uh, legal issues around um, IP and privacy. Um, is there a case for creating a new right with data which would relate to synthetic medical data as well as mm -hmm. creative data. I saw an M&M &M, um, sample being used live the other day mm -hmm. very convincingly. Yes. Is there a need for a right to actually um, permit your data to be used for training purposes or an ML purpose, for example, something of that kind? So it's a good question. I think there are certainly people floating a kind of right to privacy over your data like that. Um, the problem is that if there was, the entire ecosystem falls apart because these models are all trained on just scraping the internet, right? And that could be the entirety of Wikipedia, but it could also be the entirety of Twitter's feed or um, your Instagram profile and so on. In fact, we had, we had the scandal with Clearview AI. I don't know if you heard of it, which is a facial recognition tool, which basically just scraped the web. And so basically everyone here would probably be on Clearview identifiable. Um, so I think the first challenge really is how do we govern data acquisition in the first place? Um, and synthetic data could be part of the solution, right? If you don't have to scrape the web for real people's images and you can generate a really good data set of fake images, that's great. But you then need to make sure that all of those images are licensed, the photo, um, the, the actors or the, the, the subjects have given consent and are being potentially commercially rewarded. Um, and there are some companies that are trying to do this who are claiming to be making you know, ethical, secure data sets where all of the people involved are consenting, um, they're getting paid, um, and that might be the way forward, but it's going to make creating these models a lot more expensive. Um, but that might have to happen if, as you suggested, the law the law changes too. So, yeah, watch that space. Question at the back. Oh, that was a very similar question. In that case, we'll move up to over here. Thank you. Um, I think my question relates to a couple of things that's been raised, uh, specifically the synthetic healthcare stuff. And mm. 
I guess I'm wondering where you think we can sort of get the intuitions from what we should do in certain cases. So, given <coughs> that, you know, we talk about like EU AI regulations, so there's a lot, there will be like democratic processes involved in deciding how we should go forward, what should be allowed and what shouldn't. And I guess I'm curious what you think where the demos, as it were, will get their sort of sense from, from what should be done or not. And to give like one example where I'm not sure where I should get my intuition from, what I think that's right or wrong, is thinking about what would happen, say, if we had pornography, deep fake pornography, which doesn't include real people, but includes fake people. And it seems like in that case, I'm actually not sure what I think about that. Um, I mean, you could sort of think about this kind of, I don't know, almost like purge situation where people would now be able to live out, you know, their most evil desires. You know, it might think, mm. great. Mm. <laughs> At least you don't need to do it to real people. Or you might think, well, that, that still makes me kind of ick. And I guess I'm wondering how, and I guess this relates to you saying this is so new. It's so new, it seems hard for me. Where would I get the intuition from? The only thing I can think about is maybe how we think about fiction generally, because that seems maybe most akin to this kind of case. But I'm curious where you think, where, where do the reasons come from for us making a democratic decision sort of one way or the other? Mm. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, I think, so just, just, I mean, there are similar arguments that are put forward around child pornography, for example, like, you, you know, create synthetic child pornography so that pedophiles don't actually have to consume real stuff to starve out that that's the ecosystem obviously incredibly controversial incredibly um highly charged area um there are companies as well that are trying to make precisely the kind of synthetic pornography you're talking about with non-existent people but obviously non-existent still trained on a data set of, of real people um the question around intuition is is difficult and i think it's precisely that reason that I'm working on this and there are a lot of philosophers and policy makers and other folks who are dedicating their lives to these questions now right which is I guess my, my point was more that you know we have an intuition and these things will make us feel a certain way if certain as you said that ick feeling um that 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 is something that arises in you without you choosing right um and I guess for me I think at the moment when things are moving so fast that is a better baseline than, than trying to sort of codify everything very formally right now. Um, it's a bit like with Black Mirror as well, right? Classic, you know, those shows are designed to give you situations which aren't always explicitly malicious, but they kind of, they're always, un they're always a bit unsettling, right? And so I think that's the way that I'm looking at this at the moment is how can we figure out which areas that we really need to work on based on which are the areas that really kind of trigger that, that unease in our intuition. Um, some of those things may well be that we, you know, we get used to it. Um, and, you know, there are certainly technologies like electricity, as that poster showed, um, that, that we have got used to and we're glad that we did. But I think there are also going to be a fair few, particularly with this technology, that don't. So I think for now, intuition is the best and hopefully the proper philosophers will sort it out soon enough. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the front here. So I think I'll work sort of down that way. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for your talk. Very interesting. I would like to ask... Um, so for for this deep fake um, fake issues, where do you think that it will go down the hill um, twenty years down the line, fifty years down the line? How would you envisage that we would be like um, fifty years in the future? You're as bad as the journalists. They always ask me that question, and I always hate answering it. It's a hard one. Um, Julian and I were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, I've been working in this space specifically for about five or six years, which feels like an age for me, given how fast it's moved. But even I was, was shocked at how quickly things moved last year. That was just unprecedented. Um, ChatGPT got 100 million users in two months. Fastest growing consumer product ever. Um, and the reason it's getting those users is because people are actually finding value in it and are using it, right? Um, I think we're going to see sooner rather than later vast majority of the content we consume being synthetic because it will be cheaper it will be quicker and it'll be more accessible just in the same way that social media democratize the ability to share information these tools make everyone a movie producer right and um as they become more powerful more accessible i think we're going to see just incredibly powerful technologies that we couldn't really have imagined a few years ago being in the hands of everyday people i think it's going to be very tumultuous i think it's going to be a very disruptive period um and I hope that governments, as they didn't do perhaps with social media or other emerging technologies that were disruptive, I hope they 
are more proactive this time around because I think the stakes are much higher. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried for that time horizon, but hopefully it will give me a job for the next 20 years. So that's <laughs> something. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Henry, for this great talk. Um, I had a, kind of an example of a, of a query, for example. Um, if, you, if there was a movie and the actors were fake, like, for example, the, the Messi example, um, but they still want to like, be part of that movie, uh, but just as a voiceover, would that be classed as an actor or like a voice over, like how do you draw the line between someone being part of and consenting to become, you know, an actor or for example, someone's dead, like how do you draw the line between someone being an actor or a, or a voiceover kind of? Yeah, so, so it's a really interesting space. Um, we have seen, for example, with Bruce Willis, <laughs> um, the famous actor who recently was diagnosed or was in publicly announced to have um, he's developed dementia. And people were wondering for the last few years why he's been appearing in slightly less high quality films than they would expect. And it's clearly because he was trying to secure his family's future. Um, but he actually licensed his face to a Russian telecoms company pre the invasion to put his face on a body double for their advert as kind of a John McClane style character. Um, and he licensed his face for that specific use. And I believe he was somehow credited, but it wasn't explicitly disclosed to the audience that it wasn't actually him. You know, they didn't know necessarily that there was a body double involved. Um, and similarly, I've had discussions with people at SAG-AFTRA, the Actors Guild, about, for example, if there was a person who was doing a performance with a celebrity's face, an actor's face swapped over the top, and they were to win an award for that performance, who does the award go to? Um, you know, the person's facial movements are all theirs, but then obviously the person's face on top, does that contribute anything meaningful? Um, maybe so, maybe not. So there are lots of really interesting questions about how this new generation of actors may evolve, how a celebrity like Tom Hanks might be able to continue or mission, you know, I, I think I said to the Times, you know, Mission Impossible 20, 200 years from now, and it's, it's he's dead. Tom Cruise isn't there anymore, but he's still in the films and his family is still making a lot of money off that. So lots of really difficult questions there to kind of work through. Um, yeah. we, we should ask Andy Serkis at some point, but um, <laughs> we're beginning to run out of time. There's still a number of questions. I'll fit in as many as I can. Um, we have one over here first. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned quite a few times kind of how fast this technology is moving and, and the potential it has. And also, you know, there are po both positive and negative uses for it. So like the positive uses in healthcare, but people just being so kind of afraid of this new technology that they won't be able to harness the, the positive uh, you know, potential of it. So mm. is there any way for people who aren't in the field to stay informed to, to any degree about these developments um, and about these uses so that they can harness some of the positive uses of the technology? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess, is that a question about what kind of resources would I point you towards or are you talking about the general public as such? Sure. So, so there are some really great newsletters and um, kind of frequent updated kind of news platforms that are really good for this stuff. And I'll be, I'd be happy to share some links afterwards if you would like. Uh, one's called Synthedia, which is very good. They do a daily newsletter of big developments in the space. Um, but I'm, unfortunately, even you know, for me, and this is what I do, I am really struggling right now to keep on top of all of this. It is moving so, so fast. Um, and particularly once the Silicon Valley venture capital firms get their claws into it and everyone's looking to raise millions of money, just like with the dot-com bubble, it's not adding dot-com anymore, it's adding generative AI to your pitch deck. So that really has led to the noise in the space growing and becoming harder to, to kind of sift through it. But yeah, happy to share some suggestions afterwards. Um, the question from Ella Curry, is there any scope for retrospective data protection? So she says she's never been too worried about information being out on the internet because she doesn't have anything to hide. But those were decisions made before some of these new technologies came along. And you might want to make different choices in the new technological context, not filling, sharing a face, not filling in forms and so forth. Is there any way to change what has already been done mm. now that the terms and what it might be used for have changed? So that, yeah. that, that's, a, that's, that's a great question. I must say I don't actually know. Um, I'm not kind of a direct expert on the data side of things. I think it is worth considering how, you know, when, when the game changes, maybe so should the rules, right? Um, and, and certainly these technologies are changing the game very, very fast. Um, I don't know precisely how 
um, that would work in practice, actually kind of retroactively saying this thing that you did, I don't want you to have done now. It, I guess it maybe depends if you're looking at a more um, a civil lawsuit, right? Actually taking legal action against someone or if you're kind of asking for a takedown notice or something like this. Um, but I think the, the, the sad answer for me really is that the internet is such a messy space. Um, getting something like that to work would be very difficult. We have to do a slightly quick fire round with some of the questions. There was one up here. And then one over here, and then if we can get more, I'll, I'll get more in. I'll try and be quick. Thank you, Henry. Um, technically, how would we appear on camera and make it very hard to be deep faked or um, bished, I believe you called it? Um, for example, I notice it struggles with wearing glasses. Um, I was about to say, you're doing one, one thing right so far. <laughs> um, Any guidelines? Yeah, um, so typically, at the moment, at least, when it comes to face swapping, for example, it struggles with occlusion, so passing objects over the facial region, turning the head, different side profiles, wearing jewellery, like earrings. Again, maybe, maybe not to taste, but, you know, it can help. Um, but, for example, TikTok just released a new filter last week, a new beauty filter, which works perfectly with occlusion, and it's quite terrifying. So I'm reticent to give you direct answers because by the time that you may start putting them into practice the game might have changed again and then you may have false confidence as what to go for but occlusion of the face is the big one that's the hardest um, particularly with more traditional deep faking techniques such as face swapping so one way is to say out out of the camera shot right at the top there oh hello yes you mentioned that some white collar jobs might already be under threat i was just wondering how close are we for software engineers, programmers, for their jobs to be the people who are creating those AI? Mm. Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Uh, we're seeing, um, for example, GitHub, uh, the Microsoft uh, platform, Colab platform, um, they have a tool called Copilot, which is based off OpenAI's Codex tool. Over 50% of GitHub users are now using this Copilot tool, which is basically auto-generating code. A lot of companies are unhappy about that because they don't think it's very secure and they don't think it's very good. But a lot of people are already using it as a hack to make themselves more efficient. I think it's only a matter of time before companies who are desperate to cut costs on human capital, developers are always expensive, um, try and do it. It's whether they can do it robustly, right? Obviously, if your code breaks and you've got no one there to actually come fix it, you're going to be in trouble. Um, but I, th I think it's inevitable that we'll see a greater level of automation there for sure. Question there, yeah. Um, I was I'm really interested in the word synthetic and the generative AI. I'm wondering to what extent do you think the ability of generative AI, such as to paint the two illustrations on the screen, would you consider that as creativity or would it be possible for the generative AI to be creative? Oh, that's really hard. That's a really difficult one. Um, just in terms of time, I'm happy to discuss outside a little bit more if you'd like. I think... There are different definitions of what creativity is based from different philosophers. I personally feel that there isn't creativity there as such. I think because of the nature of the process, um, it's much more about trying to appease a human based on human feedback and a, and a learning loop. Um, it doesn't come from a place of curiosity and I guess that side of things for me is, is pretty uh, central to creativity. But I know there are many who would disagree with me. We actually held a big uh, event here a number of years ago with DeepMind um, about what was creativity, and it was, there were some really interesting things. I'm sure they would have, they would have very much disagreed with me. Can I fit in three really quick questions, and then I think we'll call it to her. So one's over here. I think you had a question. There's a mic just coming to you. There's one over here. Um, hi. I've stumbled upon a couple of articles and um, discussions in which people would talk about what kind of data the AI is uh, trained with. Or let's say it was trained with data from the 50s or when about something where the research has, has been done on, um, let's say, uh, more on a certain sex or um, ethnicity. And people would argue that some AIs could be potentially racist. What do you think about this? Really interesting question. Um, I think there's a really difficult question here, which is we're seeing manifesting in the culture wars around things like ChatGPT about certain answers that have been censored. Um, you know, uh, one involving HP Lovecraft, I won't go into detail here, but it's, it, you know, caused a lot of 
kind of fight, it's fighting between kind of particularly far right and, and, and more centrist left left wing individuals about this truth being censored by these models. I think there's a question about do we want these models to represent the world as it is or how we think it ought to be. That's difficult when it comes to training data, which is the world, right? 